Hello, my name is Don Carson. You are watching the second in a series of 14 talks designed to help you discover what the Bible says. About a century ago, the Times of London, certainly at that point in history the most prestigious English language newspaper in the world, hosted various fascinating discussions in its columns and on its editorial pages. At one juncture, the editors invited a number of well-known writers and thinkers to contribute a piece on one designated topic. What is wrong with the world? Opinions were diverse and learned. G.K. Chesterton, proverbial for his clear-headed wit, weighed in with a simple letter to the editors. To answer the question, what is wrong with the world? He wrote, Dear Sirs, I am. Yours sincerely, G.K. Chesterton. This talk centers on how the Bible would answer that question. The second part, the God who did not wipe out rebels. And the passage that we will focus on especially is Genesis 3. Now you may recall I said at the end of the last hour that Genesis 1 and 2 sets the stage for what goes wrong. And in general terms, of course, that was, that was correct. What I neglected to say, however, is that there's a particular element in chapter 2 that sets the stage for chapter 3. And that is, chapter 2 in verse 17 records one prohibition that God gives to Adam and Eve. They are to enjoy the garden, all its fecundity. They're to work at it, enjoy it, it's a place of delight, but they are not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. There is a prohibition. And if you do eat of it, you will die. Now, we'll consider in due course why God bothered to give a prohibition. Wasn't that sort of setting them up for failure? We'll consider that in due course. But without that prohibition, we cannot possibly understand chapter 3. Let me begin by reading chapter 3 right through, then making a couple of comments about uh, how to understand it, and then work it through again. This is what the Bible says. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? The woman said to the serpent, We may eat fruit from the trees in the garden. But God did say, You must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it, or you will die. You will not certainly die, the serpent said to the woman. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened, and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye, and also desirable for gaining wisdom, she took some and ate it. She also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate it. Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they realized they were naked, so they sewed fig leaves together and made coverings for themselves. Then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day, and they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man, Where are you? He answered, I heard you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And he said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The man said, The woman you put here with me, she gave me some fruit from the tree, and I ate it. Then the Lord God said to the woman, What is this you have done? The woman said, The serpent deceived me, and I ate. So the Lord God said to the serpent, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. 
To Adam he said, Because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your brow you will eat your food, until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken. For dust you are, and to dust you will return. Adam named his wife Eve, because she would become the mother of all the living. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife, and clothed them. And the Lord God said, The man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. He must not be allowed to reach out his hand and take also from the tree of life and eat and live forever. So the Lord God banished him from the Garden of Eden to work the ground from which he had been taken. After he drove them out, he placed on the east side of the Garden of Eden cherubim and a flaming sword flashing back and forth to guard the way to the tree of life. How shall we understand this chapter? In quite another part of the Bible, one that we're not going to have time to explore in detail, the account is told of King David who seduces a young woman next door. And when he is caught out, he arranges to have her husband killed. So you have a powerful man and a weak man, and the thing that is desired, in this case, the woman. When the prophet Nathan is sent by God to confront King David for this cleverly concealed adultery and murder, because the king is, at the end of the day, an autocrat, Nathan approaches with a certain amount of care, and he tells a parable. Your Majesty, he says, um, uh, something's gone wrong up country. There's a, a really, really rich farmer. Herds and cattle, flocks, you wouldn't believe. And next door is a dirt farmer. One little lamb. That's it. Well, he doesn't even have that anymore. Some people came by to see the rich dude, and he went and swiped the one poor little lamb from the dirt farmer. So a very powerful man a weak man, and something that's desired. Initially, David doesn't see the connection, but eventually he does, and he's exposed, and he's crushed by it, and so forth. But you can see what the parable is doing. It's getting to an analogous situation by telling something similar in an account. Do you see? A rich man, a weak man, and that which is desired. And yet, if you compare the stories, you also see differences. What's desired in the first instance is a woman. What's desired in the second instance is a lamb. In the first instance, it's that which is desired which is killed. It's, 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 it's rather the weak man that is killed. It's the, it's the weak man who is killed so that uh, David can hide his sin. In the second instance, it's that which is desired that is killed, the lamb itself. The stories are not parallel. If they were exactly the same, of course, it wouldn't be an analogy. It wouldn't be a parable. So sometimes when stories are told, they get the grist of the thing out there, but they may be sufficiently symbol-laden that you have to work your way through things. So here we'll see in due course that this serpent may be the embodiment of Satan, or he may be the symbol for Satan, and the Bible doesn't really care to explain which. It doesn't care. What it does say about Satan can be delineated pretty precisely. But exactly what the communication arrangements were in Eden, we cannot understand exactly. Now, with that introduction, let me suggest four things that emerge unmistakably from this chapter. Number one, the deceitful repulsiveness of that first rebellion, especially verses 1 to 6, the deceitful repulsiveness of that first rebellion. We're introduced to the serpent. 
Now, according to later scripture, again, the last book of the Bible, we're told that Satan himself stands behind this serpent in some sense in Revelation 12. Moreover, his smooth talk aligns him with another description of Satan, where we're told that um, he goes about as an angel of light, deceiving, if it were possible, the very chosen ones of God. A smart mouth. We're also told that he was made by God. The serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. In other words, the Bible does not set Satan up or the serpent up as a kind of anti-God, like matter and antimatter, with exactly the same power and potency, and when they collide, they explode and there's nothing. There is not God and then an equivalent anti-God, a bit like the light side and the dark side in the force, and you lean one way or you lean the other way. That's just not the picture. The picture is that even Satan himself is a dependent being, a created being. This passage does not tell us how or when he fell. Elsewhere, he's clearly part of the angelic number who rebelled against God. The angels had their own forms of rebellion, we learn elsewhere but none of that is described here. He just shows up. We're told in our English versions that he was the most crafty of the wild animals that God had made. Now, I was brought up in French Canada and learned English in Canada and lived in Europe for many years so that my ears don't always hear things exactly the way American ears hear things. But does the word crafty to you suggest surreptitiousness and sneakiness? Does it have negative overtones? It does to me. But the word that is used here in Hebrew can be either positive or negative depending on the context. In many places, it's, a, it's rendered something like prudence. For example, in Proverbs 12, a prudent man keeps his knowledge to himself. It doesn't mean a crafty man, sneaky little blighter. It, it means someone who's wise and, and prudent, do you see? Or again, Proverbs 14, the prudent are crowned with knowledge. It doesn't mean the crafty are. I suspect that the image then in the very first verse is of this being who was crowned with more prudence than all the others, but in rebelling it became craftiness. The very same virtue that is such a strength, once twisted, becomes a vice. In any case, he approaches the woman. What the modes of communication were, I have no idea. And he does not begin by a denial or a direct temptation. He begins with a question. Did God really say that? Did, did God really say you're not to eat of the fruit in the garden? Now notice what he's doing. It expresses just the right amount of skepticism, a slightly incredulous, can you really believe that God would say that? like an employee? Can you imagine what the boss has done this time? Except that the person whose word is being questioned is the maker, the designer, God, the sovereign. In some ways, the question is both disturbing and flattering. It smuggles in the assumption that we have the ability, even the right, to stand in judgment of what God has said. And then the devil has made it worse by exaggeration. God did forbid one fruit. The way he frames the question, did God forbid you to eat any of the fruit in the garden? Hmm? Which casts God as the cosmic party pooper. God basically exists to spoil my fun. I might want a snack, but God says, no, I want to do something. God says, no, 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 he's just the cosmic party pooper. Can you believe that God said that? She replies with a certain amount of insight, wisdom, and grace, at least initially. She corrects him on his facts. She says,
God did say you must not eat from the tree that is in the middle of the garden. But we may eat from the trees in the garden. His exaggeration is set aside. But then she adds her own exaggeration. Over against what the devil says, we may eat from the trees in the garden. But God did say you must not eat fruit from the tree that is in the middle of the garden, and you must not touch it. God hadn't said anything about not touching it. It's almost as if the prohibition to eat has got her sufficiently riled up that she has to exaggerate the meanness of the prohibition. And then comes the first overt contradiction of God. You will not certainly die. The first doctrine denied in the Bible is the doctrine of judgment. It's often the case. Because if you can get rid of that one, then you're free to do anything. There are no consequences. Indeed, God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. Here is the big ploy, the total temptation. The heart of the vicious deceitfulness in what the serpent promises is partly true and totally false. It's true, after all. Her eyes will be opened, and in some sense, she will see the difference between good and evil. She will determine it for herself. God himself says so at the end of the chapter. After all, God says, verse 22, the man has now become like one of us, knowing good and evil. And yet... God knows good and evil with the knowledge of omniscience. He knows all that has been, all that is, all that will be, all that would have been under different circumstances. He knows it all. She comes to know it by experience. My wife is a cancer survivor. She's had a double mastectomy. They still watch her very closely. The oncologists know an awful lot about cancer from the outside. She knows cancer from the inside. God knows all there is to know about sin, but not by becoming a sinner. She'll find out about the knowledge of good and evil from the inside. It's a total lie. Indeed, the expression in Hebrew, the knowledge of good and evil, is often used in places where to have the knowledge of good and evil is to have the ability to pronounce what is good and pronounce what is evil. That's what God had done, if you recall. He had made something, it was good. He made something else, it was good. He made the whole thing, and it was very good. For God has this sovereign, grounded in infinite knowledge ability to pronounce what is good. And now this woman wants this godlike function. God says, it's not good to eat that fruit. You'll die. But if she does, she's pronouncing her own good and evil. She's becoming like God. Claiming the sort of independence that belongs only to God. The self-existence that belongs only to God. To be as God, to achieve it, in fact, by outwitting Him or to, to, to rebel against Him. It's an intoxicating program. That means that God himself will henceforth be regarded, consciously or not, at least as a rival, and maybe as an enemy. Because I pronounce my own good, thank you. Now I suppose we need to think a little bit more about this tree. What was the fruit? There is no text that says it was an apple as if God really hates apples, but 
is rather partial towards um, pineapples and pears. It's not even necessary to suppose that the apple is a kind of magical thing, such that by ingesting this particular fruit, whatever it is, that suddenly a switch goes on in the brain, the chemistry changes, and now you suddenly start pronouncing good and evil. That's not quite the point. Regardless of what it is, it's something that is an inevitable test. If God makes image bearers and pronounces what is good and what is evil, he orders the whole system, then to come along at any point and say, no, I will declare my own good. What you say is evil, I will declare to be good. What you say is good, I will declare to be evil. Makes that thing the knowledge of good and evil. That's why it's called the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. It's not the kind of fruit that is crucial. It's the rebellion. It's the standing over against God. It's the de of God. It is, in short, idolatry. It wasn't sex either. Through the history of the Christian church, many people have argued that the, 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 the tree here is really a symbol for, for, for sex. But in fact, when God brings the man and woman together in this first marriage, he thinks it's all very good. And long after this chapter, toward the end of the Bible, one of the writers says, marriage is honorable in all, and the bed undefiled. There's nothing in the Bible that says that sex is intrinsically evil, though like all of goods, God's good gifts, it can be abused and distorted and twisted, perverted. No, this is not simply an invitation to break a rule, or arbitrary or otherwise. That's what a lot of people think that sin is, just breaking a rule. What is at stake here is something deeper, bigger, sadder, uglier, more heinous. It's a revolution. It makes me God, and thus de-gods God. And when the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable for gaining wisdom, physically appealing, aesthetically pleasing, sapientially transforming, transforming by wisdom, she took some and ate. For those of you who know the language take and eat, which Christians recite at the Lord's Supper, it's impossible not to think that take and eat language, so simple the act, so hard the undoing, as someone has said, this take and eat language won't be connected with salvation and forgiveness and transformation until someone has died in our stead. But that's much farther down the line. And she gave some to Adam, and he ate it. Apparently, he was with her in all of this. Here's the ugliness of the whole thing. And then, secondly, the initial consequences that erupted from this first rebellion. What there is, initially, is a massive inversion. God makes the man who loves his wife, who comes from him, and together they are to be vice regents over the created order, now instead, one of the created order, the serpent, seduces the woman who hauls in the man, and together they defy God. There's a massive inversion of the whole thing. And of course, there's death. It's not too surprising. If God is the creator and gives life, then if you detach yourself from this God, if you defy this God, what is there but death? He is the one that brought it all into being in the first place. He didn't bring it into being that it might be completely autonomous from him. So if one walks away from him, what is there but death? If you pronounce your own good and evil and decide for yourself what is up and what is down. 
then you have detached yourself from the God who made you. And there is nothing but death. What kind of death? Christians have wrestled with this one. In the fourth century, there was a Christian thinker by the name of Augustine who wrote, if it be asked what death God threatened them with, whether bodily or spiritual, or that second death, that's language that is used for hell itself. We answer, it was all. God comprehends in this not only the first part of the first death. When the soul loses God, we die. We, we, we hide from God. We're dead to God. But the second part also where our body returns to the ground and our very being before God is, is lost and condemned. Or even the ultimate death, the last of deaths, eternal, following after all. You cannot cut yourself off from the God of the Bible without consequences. But note the results that are immediately emphasized by the text. We're told, verse 7, their eyes were opened. They knew they were naked. And in consequence, they sewed fig leaves together for a covering. Now, at one level, the serpent had kept his promise. But this new consciousness of good and evil, this determination to specify what is good and evil in our own little world, is not a happy result. It's... Insight is demonstrable, but it results in massive and grotesque anticlimax. There's no pleasure, finally, but shame, guilt. Now they have something to hide. So they sow fig leaves, which is meant to be a bit silly. You can't hide moral shame with fig leaves. But it's also a way of saying that there's no way back to Eden. You can't undo that sort of thing. If, if you commit a theft, you can return what you've stolen. In that sense, you can undo it. But the stain in your own being can't be undone. If you commit adultery, you can't undo it. If, if you or I defy God, we, we, we cannot... Undo the defiance. It, 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 it can't be undone. There's no way back. We're now covered in shame. And so as a result, there's this broken fellowship with God in verses 8 to 10. Instead of enjoying God's fellowship, whatever it meant to say that God walked with them in the cool of the day, he met with them and they enjoyed him. Throughout all of Christian experience, in every religion, there have been elements of human experience that have tried to connect with God, to feel Him, to enjoy some sort of mystical experience with God or the gods or the other or the transcendent. These people knew this kind of intimate connection with God, their Maker, in unsurpassed joy and the most intimate communion and delighted in it, and now it was gone. You catch some small, small glimpse of it. If you've been married for 10 years in a really, really, really good marriage, and then you slip up, and you, you sleep with somebody you shouldn't sleep with, and you know it, and your spouse knows it, you can't look in the eye anymore. Their shame. You hide. There's certain things you can't talk about anymore. That's why throughout the Bible, in fact, sometimes human sin before God is described in terms of sexual betrayal. In one Old Testament writer, Hosea, about the 8th century before Christ, God is presented, it's hard to believe, as the ultimate cuckold, the ultimate betrayed husband, because his own people 
abandon him and chase other gods. Even though he's given them life. And there's broken fellowship with each other, too. It's, it's, it's almost funny in a sad, degenerate sort of way. Have you eaten from the tree that I commanded you not to eat from? The woman you put here with me, it's her fault. Not the last time some character has blamed his wife. But she's no better. Not my fault, God. I mean, that serpent, I mean, he, he really fooled me. One of the things that happens where there's this kind of rebellion, of course, is that uh, you don't take responsibility. You just duck. And then comes, in the third place, the explicit curses that God pronounces in the wake of this rebellion. Verses 14 and following. There are three. God says to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and all wild animals. You will crawl on your belly and you will eat dust all the days of your life. And I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will crush your head and you will strike his heel. Now there are some people who think that this is a kind of fairy tale, what's called an etiological myth, a just so story, how the serpent lost his legs. Now, that's what this story is really about, you see. Once upon a time, snakes were really serpents and they all had legs. And, and then this is how the serpent lost its legs. Is that what it's about? Oh, who knows? But I do know this. Sometimes God picks up something that is already there and uses it in a new symbol-laden way. In the last hour this evening, we'll be introduced to this chap, Abraham. And Abraham is told to introduce circumcision to the men in his family and clan. But you must understand that circumcision wasn't invented by God or by Abraham. Circumcision was practiced throughout the ancient Near East. It was not an unknown rite. But when God imposed it, for reasons we'll see shortly, when God imposed it, it had a new special symbol-ladenness in the context of his relationship with Abraham. It wasn't a brand new phenomenon, but it had a new symbol relationship to reality. So also here, this snake may well have been squirreling along the ground, but now it becomes a deeply symbol-laden thing. The devil himself is cast out and is rejected, a slimy thing, rejected, running along the ground, as it were. And the symbolism of the Bible keeps along those lines. The prophet Isaiah, late 8th century, for example, in the 65th chapter, describes a day coming when the wolf and the lamb will feed together, the lion will eat straw like the ox, and dust will be the serpent's food. Not because serpents are somehow less moral than lions, but in the symbolism of the day. The serpent was connected with the devil, with all that was slimy and low down, disgusting. When we're told, I will put enmity between you and the woman, between the serpent and the woman, and between your offspring and hers, this does not mean that all women will hate snakes. Now, I know some that do, including my wife. My wife, whatever her many gifts and graces, was not called to be a herpetologist. <laughs> but there are some women herpetologists. This is probing at a level much beyond mere women and snakes. In fact, the text immediately goes on to say, not only the women, but the offspring. Between your offspring and hers. That is between all human beings and all snakes, so that we all like, then in which case we can't have any herpetologists. No, that's not the point at all. No. From the woman, from the human race, will come ultimately a seed, we're told, that will crush the serpent's head. Did you see The Passion of the Christ, the Mel Gibson film? 
oh, it had its strengths and its weaknesses. But did you see the opening scene where Jesus is in an agony in the garden, praying? And in the context of his praying, a snake starts crawling over one of his limbs. Jesus stands up and suddenly slams his head down, his, his foot down on the serpent's head. The symbolism is right out of here. By going to the cross, Jesus will ultimately destroy this serpent, this devil, who holds people to sin and shame and guilt. He will go and crush the serpent's head by taking their guilt and shame in himself. This verse is sometimes called, in Christian circles, the Protevangelium. That is the first announcement of the gospel. The first announcement of good news. It's pretty doom and darky till now. But now there's promise that from the woman's seed, from the human race, will arise one who will crush the serpent's head. In fact, that can be extended to Christians. In Romans 16, a letter written by the Apostle Paul about the middle of the first century to Christians in Rome, in the 16th chapter, he writes to Christians in Rome and he says, the Lord will crush the serpent's head under your heel. There is a sense, you see, in which Christians, by living under the gospel, by being reconciled to God because of the gospel, they are destroying the devil and his work. Already a seedbed sowed countless years earlier in Genesis 3. Then to the woman, he said, I will make your pains in childbearing very severe. With pain you will give birth to children. Your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Now, the first categorical command that had been given to the man and the woman in chapter 1 had been, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it. But even this most fundamental of rights and privileges Part of their very being now becomes a pain-filled thing. The whole created order is out of whack. It's, it's bound up with loss. Your desire will be for your husband and he will rule over you. That passage has been interpreted in many different ways, as you can imagine. It is worth reflecting on the fact that the two verbs that are used your desire will be for your husband, he will rule over you, are used together as a pair in only one other place within the first five books of the Bible. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. Hundreds of pages, it's used in only one other place. Namely, in the next chapter. So that if a first reader were coming along and reading this and saying, boy, I don't have a clue what's going on here, the reader only has to press on a few more verses and that reader will stumble across the same verbs again and then say, aha, uh -huh, that makes sense. It's in chapter 4 where we find out that one of the sons of Adam and Eve, Cain, wants to kill the other son. We have the first murder, the first homicide. And when the Lord is explaining to Cain why God is angry with him, he says to him, chapter 4, verse 7, If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you not, do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. Now the two verbs. Sin desires to have you. That is to have you in the sense of control you, to manipulate you, to boss you around. But you must rule over it. So also here, in the wake of the fall, the woman desires to have her husband precisely now to control him. And he rules over her. That is with a certain kind of brutality. There is sin on both sides. She wants to control, and physically he's stronger than she is, and he, 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 he regularly beats up on her. Well, what we have now is the destruction of the marriage relationship itself because of sin in this world. And then you read on through the following chapters, the first homicide, 
first double murders, the first polygamy, eventually the first genocide, on and on and on and on and on, all because at the very beginning, someone said, I will be God. And likewise, Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate from the tree about which I commanded you, you must not eat of it. That is, you listen to her instead of to me. At the end of the day, our prime allegiance must be to God himself. Cursed is the ground because of you. That is, the whole created order of which you are a part is now not working properly. It's under a curse, subjected by God himself to death and decay through painful toil. As a result, you will eat of it all the days of your life. It will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you will eat the plants of the field. Now, we could press on, but we must observe the last step in this chapter, the long-term effects that flowed from this rebellion. The Lord God made garments of skin for Adam and his wife and clothed them. Now, that's interesting. They used fig leaves. If he uses garments of skin, then there has been the shedding of blood. A sacrificial animal. Now, at this stage, there is no system of sacrifice. That comes later. A priestly system with, with sacrifices and prescribed animals and a tabernacle or a temple. We'll come to that. None of that's in place. None of it's in place. But God knows they need to be covered. They have so much shame to hide. He doesn't say, take off those stupid fig leaves. If you just expose yourself and be honest with one another, we can all get back together again and live happily ever after. There's no way back. He covers them with something more durable, but at the price of an animal that sheds its blood and is slain. The first of long trajectories of bloody sacrifices that reach all the way down to the coming of Jesus, who is announced by one who comes just before him, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That is, by His bloody sacrifice, by His death, we are covered over. Our shame and our guilt addressed because He dies in our place. A lamb can't do that. Here it's just a picture of what's coming. But it's the first step of a whole institution of sacrifices that point us finally to the supreme sacrifice and what Jesus did to take away our sin and cover up our shame. Now then, let me conclude. I want to reflect on how this fits into the Bible and into our lives. Number one, Genesis 3 describes willful rebellion not sociobiology. It describes willful rebellion, not sociobiology. You see, one of the hard things that a strict materialistic Darwinism must face is where do morals come from? Where does meaning come from? Where do notions of right and wrong come from? But in the last two or three decades, there has arisen a field of scientific, philosophical endeavor now commonly labeled sociobiology. One writer has entitled his book, The Selfish Gene, in which he argues, because of the way we've developed along evolutionary lines, we have genes that, that, that protect us those genes which move us toward um, certain behavior are, are, are going to keep alive those people that have the genes that uh, perform the behavior that is most advantageous to living. Those that don't have this advantageous behavior will drop away. And therefore, statistically, you will get a higher and higher percentage of those that have these kinds of genes that are nicely adaptive. And that very selfish gene might learn somewhere along the line that cooperation 
with other people with similar genes is better than merely going it alone. So now you have a genetic predisposition towards working cooperatively and sharing, which might not fit some simplistic view of the survival of the fittest, but at the corporate level, as sociobiology, it makes a whole lot of sense. That is to say, you can develop a whole bias towards certain behavior that you call good or evil just on the basis of the various selection of genes that, that the time and experience teach you generation by generation. In other words, there is a systematic attempt today to explain notions of right and wrong purely at the genetic naturalistic level. And I would be the last person to want to argue that there is no connection between our morals and our bodies, between our wills and spirits and our heritage and background, including our genetic makeup. We are whole beings. All of them interact together. But it is very, very difficult to imagine people volunteering, volunteering to sacrifice their lives for the sake of others, taking pain in their place, a person in Auschwitz pretending that he or she did the terrible deed that would get another hanged just to take their place. It's hard to think of that as merely adaptive behavior. So that nowadays entire books and essays have begun to be written back the other way, saying sociobiology cannot possibly explain this conduct and that conduct and the other conduct. If you're interested in such matters, I'll be glad to give you more bibliography. There's a chap called Pete Lohman who wrote A Long Way East of Eden. You recall how when they left the garden they went east of Eden? Simply to show that the account of the fall makes much more sense of the dilemmas and perversions and twisted livings in the world than any other explanation. Or the sociologist Christian Smith, Moral Believing Animals. But secondly, Genesis 3 does not think of evil primarily in horizontal terms, but in vertical terms. You, you see, when we do think of evil finally, depending on who we are, we tend to think of evil at the horizontal level. Horizontal level. Probably none of us here would want to deny that Auschwitz was evil. Probably we, we don't want to deny that... Um, Raping a little child is evil. Probably we don't want to deny that operating a huge Ponzi scheme that rips people off of billions is evil. We don't want to deny that. And certainly the Bible has all kinds of pretty condemning things to say about horizontal evils, that is, evils amongst ourselves. But in the Bible, what is said to make God angry most frequently is idolatry. It's the vertical dimension. The person who is most offended here is God. It's not that Eve is really ticked because Adam's blamed her. In the first instance, where the guilt is, is guilt before God. It's in the de-godding of God. So that, yes, you could read the prophet Isaiah, who warns against vicious, money-grabbing owners who won't pay fair wages. But pages and pages are devoted to idolatry. It's the supreme evil. 
It is what makes all the other evils supremely evil. And that means, in the third place, that Genesis 3 shows what we most need. If you're a Marxist, what you need are revolutionaries and decent economists. If you're a psychologist, what you need is an army of counselors. If you think that the root of all malfunction and disorder is medical, what you really need is endless numbers of Mayo Clinics. But if our first and most serious need is to be reconciled to God, a God who now stands over against us, who pronounces death upon us because of our willfully chosen rebellion, then what we need the most, though we may have all of these other derivative needs, what we need the most is to be reconciled to him. We need someone to save us. You cannot make sense of the Bible until you come to agreement with what the Bible says our problem is. If you don't see what the Bible's analysis of the problem is, you can't come to grips with the Bible's analysis of the solution. The ultimate problem is our alienation from God, our attempt to identify ourselves merely with reference to ourselves, this idolatry that de-gods God. And what we must have is reconciliation back to this God, or we have nothing. And it's in that context that already this chapter looks forward to the coming of the woman's seed. I attended a funeral not long ago. A neighbor died, brain tumor. And on the card that was handed out at the door, we found these words from this neighbor. May those that love us, love us. And those that don't love us, may God turn their hearts. And if he doesn't turn their hearts, may he turn their ankle, and we shall know them by their limping. Cute. I, I, I couldn't help thinking how tragic. The man had just gone to meet his maker. And his last words for us at the funeral were scoring points on people who didn't like him. Still thinking at a horizontal level. In the 17th century, the great thinker Pascal wrote, What sort of freak then is man? How novel, how monstrous, how chaotic, how paradoxical, how prodigious, judge of all things, feeble earthworm, repository of truth, sink of doubt and error, glory and refuse of the universe. He understood Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Or a contemporary thinker writes, We human beings are a mystery to ourselves. We are rational and irrational, civilized and savage, capable of deep friendship and murderous hostility, free and in bondage, the pinnacle of creation and its greatest danger. We are Rembrandt and Hitler, Mozart and Stalin, Antigone and Lady Macbeth, Ruth and Jezebel. Shakespeare says of humanity, what a work of art. And Arthur Miller in After the Fall says, we are very dangerous. We meet not in some garden of wax, fruit, and painted leaves that lies east of Eden, but after the fall, after many, many deaths. Now you understand the plot line of the whole Bible. Who will fix that? <laughs>